In this video, I want to talk about data and analytics in the healthcare sector. And I am here with Nina Moncton. You are the chief inside officer right, yeah. for part of the national health system, the NHS in, right, yeah. in, in England. And I would love to learn more about how you're using analytics. Um, what sort of data you're collecting, what sort of insights you're generating. So maybe you can share some of those I those can. use cases with me because I'm absolutely amazed about how you can now use data and how you're using it and, and the real benefits you're generating from it. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll probably start by saying we're quite unique in the NHS in that we don't actually provide any direct um, care for patients. We're a um, back office uh, administrator. Mm -hmm. uh, we are part of the NHS family. So we do things like the NHS pension scheme. We um, pay pharmacists, we pay dentists. And as a result of, of the, the, the activities that we do, we create vast amounts of data which are based on transactions. Mm. Um, and from that data, we have been looking at ways that, I suppose we started out looking at ways that we could help the NHS save money. So we kind of set ourselves a target of a billion pounds. That we a were... <laughs> very modest target, yeah? <laughs> Sounds modest, yeah. but actually there's 35 billion pounds worth of activity that flows through our organisation. So um, we started out with this one billion pounds target and we were looking for um, areas where there was potentially fraud, error and waste. Okay. So that was, that was the original um, sort of use case that, that we started with. Um, and the, the highest value items that we were looking at were in dental payments and in the pharmacy payments and the reimbursement of pharmacists for drugs. So um, we, we started the project with, um, it was an experiment, it was two data scientists and a, a DBA. And we had some hypotheses around things we thought that there were areas that, that there could be waste in the system based on what we understood of the, um, the regulations. And within the first six months, we'd uncovered a hundred million pounds worth of, of potential savings, which was just purely based on um, outlier activity where it couldn't really be explained from anything um, sort of normal or that was going on. It, it, it just did look like it was, um, it was it was people manipulating the system. So Interesting. So what are some of the examples? Some of the examples were, um, out-of-pocket expenses for pharmacists. So we had a look at the ratio of um, what pharmacies were earning as a proportion of their overall earnings from out-of-pocket expenses. Mm. And we found that um, you know, most pharmacies weren't claiming out-of-pocket expenses at all. They were sort of a, a, a way of compensating pharmacists for going over and above to get hold of a mm. particular drug. Um, so you'd only expect to see it in rare occasions, but we found one pharmacy that had 25% um, of their earnings were coming from um, out-of-pocket expenses when, I mean, most of the majority was none and the average was something like 0.02% mm -hmm. of earnings. So it was it was really stark. You could see that there were some pharmacies that were clearly um, making, you know, using it mm. as, as a, a means of income. Um, and then with the dentists, we, we found um, there were all kinds of interesting things going on there. Um, the the, there was manipulation around um, splitting up courses of treatment. So a dentist gets reimbursed um, or, or paid um, for carrying out what's called units of dental activity. And that's for a complete course of treatment. So if you're going to a dentist and they look in your mouth and say you need eight fillings, mm. um, then they would get the same, they would get three UDAs for your eight fillings. So what was happening was that dentists were like, well, I, you know, I could do one filling over eight courses of treatment or two fillings and then three fillings and then another however many fillings and mm. I could get nine UDAs or I could get 12 UDAs rather than just three. So what you started to see was this behavior where people were kind of not providing and we were seeing we were seeing this in the data by people coming back for their treatments more frequently you know you'd expect them to be coming in mm. so we were picking out things like that and um and then basically um set about sort of talking to the department of health about it and then working with um you know the the the, the it's NHS England now, but previously it was the primary care trust who had responsibility for dentists and 
to the same pointing it out to them in the data where this was happening um and other things like um you know mouth guards that were being prescribed for sports activities yeah. and actually you can get them off the shelf in sports direct and and that was um oh, really? off, off the nhs as well so we we used the data um and really it, it was it was simple sort of anomaly detection in terms of you know what how can we normalize this data and then bring in these things that we think potentially are um sort of money makers so it's not it's not that anyone's breaking the law but it, it's it's probably not what you describe as being in the spirit of um <laughs> spending money and, and i i think when we talked earlier you were saying that once you've highlighted some of those things to a particular dentist you could then what, what did you refer to this as the golf course uh, yeah so what we, what we were starting to see was once particular um we were we were contacting the the worst or sort of the most extreme dentists and and challenging their behavior so sort of presenting the data back to them and saying you know do you, you do realize that these are the regulations around this and this is when it's appropriate to to do these things and um what we'd see is that this dentist would change their behavior but then the local dentists would all change their behavior as well so we, we'd assumed that you know they were talking to each other and, and therefore um, realizing that uh, oh actually we shouldn't be doing that either and um, so, <laughs> so the behavior was changing we heard we found something similar as well when we were looking at um, eligibility so patients who um, say that they don't have to pay for their treatment Hmm. Um, and sometimes they should pay for their treatment and, and uh, when we were targeting particular pharmacies um, with campaigns or looking at um, you know providing penalties once the the, the, the pharmacist or the, the dentist was realizing because their patients were telling them that they were getting these penalties you could see then that there was a, a, a bit of a ripple effect and so there were fewer cases coming through that were inappropriate from those particular um, mm. places because one assumes the um, pharmacy or dentist was being a bit more careful about advising the patients of how they should be claiming. So can you give me a flavour of what data you're using, how much data you have, how you're yeah. analysing this data, so a little insight into yeah. into some of the, the yeah. tech behind the scene maybe. Yeah, so every, every year there are 1.1 billion items prescribed to patients so there's 1.1 billion rows of, of data that's mm. going into which isn't massive a massive data um dentistry there's 40 million uh dental so so we're looking at the individual um sort of the, the prescription form so everyone knows when they go to a gp in the uk or in, in england certainly they will get given a, a prescription token or told that they're prescription is, is at a pharmacy and they'll go and collect it and then the information from that so the, the pharmacy gets reimbursed by sending us that information mm. and then we, we make the payment um, with dentists it's a it's a course of treatment it's generally an electronic submission that comes into us that says I've treated this patient mm. and this is the, the treatment that they've had so and and that's essentially how they get paid so that drives um, the data that we get and actually there's nothing like a, a payment at the end to make people fill in data um, in <laughs> and a, this data sits in a data lake or database it um, sits in uh well it's in two places really it's in a, a data lake um which is used by our data scientists but we also have a data warehouse which is more structured right. so part of our role is we provide um services or information services to to the people who are looking after or commission um, dentists and pharmacists so they have access to a whole range of dashboards that, that the, um, the BI team build and push out to them so there's like 4,000 people using um, this information across the NHS wow. um, which is a challenge in itself uh, yeah. <laughs> getting these people to, to be able to use this data. So what has been your analytics journey in terms of creating the team getting the skills, putting the technology in place. Um, what does the team look like today and, and how uh, did you get there? Well, today we've got a um, we've got an infrastructure. So we've got a BI and data science infrastructure team. Mm. And they're a combination of um, data. So there's data engineers, ETL developers, um, and we've got a, 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 a BI architect that sits within that team as well and they're, they're basically looking after the environment and working with 
the business and users to make sure that it's as effective as it possibly can be. They also do things like manage the account with the cloud, so they're making sure that we don't go over budget and all that type mm -hmm. of thing. And then we've got um, the customer facing teams, which are a combination of statisticians, information analysts, trainers. Um, we've got some contact center people that, that work in there as well. So for sort of first line of support, if anybody's got a problem, they phone up and they can get help from the team. Um, we've got a data science team, which is mostly statisticians and data scientists. There's only 10 of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a big team. And then we've got also a, a kind of a businessy team. So we've got a, a sort of a mix with stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a, a you, you described it earlier that the business person the sort of the mm. translator yeah we've got one of those people we also have a coordinator um, data governance sits um, within my team mm. that was one of the things we realized um, when we started well, we started the journey that actually the hardest thing was trying to work out what data we had where it was um, how we'd get it how reliable was it when we actually got it? So data governance has been a really, a really big push and we've mm. been doing that now for about two years, we're really pushing hard to, to get all that um, going. So yeah, that's that's the mix of the team. I don't think I've forgotten anybody. <laughs> so so how, how much of the work that you're doing now is, is work that you push? So it felt like in the beginning you were finding the use cases and then yeah. pushing them into yeah, the yeah. business. How much of this is now pull, where the business comes to you and say, says, it's "This is what we want. It's this is what we probably need." Probably now, eighty percent plus pull. Um, we've got that's the balance. I think that you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we've got people queuing up for um, for with ideas as to you know what they want to productionize within the the BI environment. We've got. Um, we've moved now more because we've got the interest from external customers. Um, and a lot of them are clinicians, obviously, because they're working. We, we've got now into the space of, of doing more in in, um, in actual clinical, more clinical mm. focused reporting. So things around polypharmacy, so patients who are on lots of medications at the same time. We've been working with Public Health England and um, CCGs, uh, looking at the antimicrobial resistance strategy and how we can use our data to really um, you know, show GPs and, and CCGs how their prescribing could be changed for the, you know, to reduce the numbers. And we have actually seen a, a reduction in numbers of patients and um, broad spectrum antibiotic prescribing. So that's all been really good. Um, Amazing, yeah. And yeah, mental health, it's a, so anything that's sort of popping up on the NHS um, long-term plan. Look, there's still a really big focus on, on, you know, where we can reduce waste. So generic um you know where gps are prescribing branded products when actually they should be prescribing generics yeah um where the nhs has produced guidance around certain medications which actually um don't really have a, a huge clinical effectiveness and can be bought over the counter mm. so there's reporting around well who's still doing that and how much is being spent on it and i suppose the more you expose that information the the less people would do it Great. and you can see the the sort of the impact as to here's when the policy lands and here's how long it's taking for, for people to pick up on on that policy so where where is next for you what what sort of things would you get excited about where would you like to take some of this the, the analytics and and the data in the uh, future well so many ideas um Firstly, I think one of one of the things we've learned is that um, we're we're quite remote as an organisation from the day to day what's going on in the NHS. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ideas that I would like to take forward is to have um, I'm calling them data advocates. So um, people who are based within the the NHS regions who can actually go around and really help people to to leverage this data. That's the first thing we we, we yeah, want to do. I think it's do. a great idea. Um, the second thing I want to do is um, I, I'm I'm not a, a, I love a dashboard, but actually you know some of our audience are are going to be GPs, dentists, 
who just don't have the time to log into a system and faff around with, mm. um, you know, finding dashboards, etc. So we, we, you know, the technology allows us to be able to push uh, emails or information to people if they trip a, a particular um, trigger. Then here you are, you, you you've, you've done something, mm. and you can go and have a look if you want. But I'm telling you, you've done it, mm. and I suppose for me, it's it's the power of. It's it's not the te- it's it's not so much about the technology and the visualization and making it pretty. It's about what can I tell you mm. to make you do something different because actually you need to do something different. Mm. So if it's an email or if it's a text or, or whatever it might be, mm. um, I think that's that's the next thing because I can't I honestly can't see GPs um, logging onto a system and. and playing around with, with data. some of them will I know mm. they will but not all of them will I completely agree I, I think the more easier you can package the message yeah, and send exactly. it out exactly it's the message isn't yeah. it it's, it's not it's it's the message the third the third thing the last thing I want to do and and this this is free of um free of the the BI technology but it's still sitting on the the very good data governance and and management of data but it's open data okay and um and it is actually pushing as much of the information, obviously respecting people's um, privacy, et cetera, et cetera, but pushing as much data out as we possibly can because the more people that pick up this data and use it, and there are so many use cases for it that we could never we could never meet all of those requirements. And, and there are good organisations and people out there and academics who, who can pick up this data and mash it with other things and do great stuff with it. Mm. So it's about let's push that information as much as we can out there and let people go away and do great things with it because the more great things they do with it the better everyone's life's going to be great amazing i could carry on now for days i think you've got so many fascinating <laughs> stories to tell we, we leave it here thank you so much for your time thank you. and um, hopefully we'll catch up with you at some point in the future to see yeah. where else you've taken this so thank you thank you thanks